On this Wednesday night, trapped in an elevator, two men, no cell service, and water rising by the minute. There was panic, there was praying, there was uh, deciding that we we're going to get out of there no matter what. The police officers who swam to their rescue with just moments to spare. This as Toronto got more rain in one night than it usually gets in a month. So, are cities prepared for such extreme weather? Also tonight, the Prime Minister not bowing to Saudi Arabia as the kingdom ratchets up the pressure and the propaganda. And the debate over memorializing a painful past. The city of Victoria will become the first to tear down a statue of Sir John A. This is The National. Hold it, hold it. This is good. Look at this. It's the water. That was one of the mild reactions last night to a dangerously powerful deluge. It drenched the city, knocking out power to thousands of homes and suddenly turned streets into waterways. It also nearly turned an elevator into a death trap. Two men were working late at the office when they realized their cars were at risk in the parking garage below. The CBC's Greg Ross picks up their incredible story. Claver Fryer and Gabriel Otrin weren't sure if they would get out of this elevator alive. We uh, passed the first level down into the basement. We uh, felt and heard a, a strong whoosh. They were headed down to the parking garage to move their cars after learning rainwater had started to flood in, but they had no idea just how much. Describe the moment as that elevator hits the ground floor and that water starts coming in. It was, uh, it was an immediate shock, sort of a moment of disbelief. You no know, water started coming in right away from the bottom. They say within minutes, the water was up to their waists. As the water started coming in, we were just looking for emergency instructions, procedures, anywhere that we could, but there was not really any guidance. They managed to get a hold of an operator using the elevator's emergency phone, but the conversation was over in seconds. Right at that moment, the water rose to the level of the speaker and fried all the electronics inside. Otrin then attempted to call for help from his cell phone, but couldn't get a signal. They began looking for an escape hatch. My first thought was to, you know, uh, uh, climb up on the, the rail and, and, and try to push the, the top panel out because, you know, that's, that's what you've seen in movies. They weren't able to open it wide enough to escape, but they did pry a big enough gap to get a cell signal and call 911. Police arrived within minutes, Constables Josh McSweeney and Ryan Barnett. And we can hear them inside screaming for help and saying that the water was getting too high and that uh, they needed us. So we started trying to pull the door open, but it was just, the pressure was too great. So uh, Josh immediately went and went upstairs and got a, a pry bar. While police scrambled to try and pry the elevator door open from the outside, the water level inside was just a couple of feet from the top. Fryer and Otrin feared they may be running out of time. The water was also rising for McSweeney and Barnett. I'd say by the time we first got there, and then by the time I got the second crowbar, uh, the water risen maybe six plus inches within a few minutes. Yeah, at that time we're now treading water because we can no longer yeah. touch touch the ground. The only thing that gave me some stillness at that moment is that I said I'm, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to die in this dirty water in an elevator. That's not the way that I'm going to go. It took a few minutes that felt more like hours for the men trapped inside the elevator, but police were able to pry the doors open with a crowbar. We knew the situation, what was going on, but uh, there was no panic. We were both pretty calm and uh, we were just looking at, you know, like what we needed to do. I just remember being happy that I knew I was going to see my family. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. So why did Toronto get so drenched so quickly and just how much rain fell last night? Well, that depends on where in the city you were. The Toronto Island Airport near downtown recorded 77 millimeters, more rain than in the entire month of July. But look at this, just kilometers away, barely any precipitation at all. The heaviest rain was concentrated over a very small area. So what happened? Thunderstorms developed in the north end of Toronto around 8 o'clock. It was a slow-moving storm taking three hours to get to the southern part of Toronto. So the torrential downpour stalled over the downtown core. Didn't clear up until about midnight. The result, dramatic flash flooding, and not for the first time. As Salima Shivji reports, extreme weather is an extreme challenge in cities like Toronto. Uh, this is a, a brand new washroom that we just finished a month ago. 
Now, like the rest of the basement, it's covered in dirty sewage water. Within minutes, my whole basement was flooded, and I noticed that the, the hardwood floor was coming out, or the laminate was coming out, and it was floating. The album photos, the memories. At another yeah. home, soggy family photos are rescued and set out to dry. It's hard. What can we do? Even neighbors who weren't hit are frustrated. These are good people working hard to afford a house in the city and to have their house flooded and then flooded again and their concerns being ignored. It's happened before, flash flooding two years ago and three years before that. So there are questions over whether the city's infrastructure can handle it as the climate changes. The money is available to make sure that the infrastructure is upgraded, whether it has to do with basement flooding or some of the other kinds of effects of these storms that we have. Totally predictable, maybe not the day that it occurred. But this climate scientist says Toronto is moving in the right direction, but... but... I don't think we're doing it at a fast enough pace. The bottom line is every day we don't adapt is a day we don't have. With an older city core and so much development, the problem for Toronto officials is complex. Because we really have limited options in terms of where we can move the water and how we can move the water. And so much of the land surface has been converted to an impervious jungle of concrete and asphalt. A work in progress as cities around the world rush to adapt and this family tries to clean up today. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. No. Now to the diplomatic standoff between Ottawa and Riyadh. Tensions escalated again tonight. Coming up, we dive into the propaganda whipping up anti-Canada sentiment in Saudi Arabia. That's right, Adrian. But first, the Prime Minister is speaking out for the first time, and he's not backing down. Canada will unapologetically defend human rights anywhere in the world. That was the simple message Trudeau delivered firmly, if politely, today. David Cochran digs deeper into how Ottawa is playing its hand. Even in the middle of a diplomatic feud, the show must go on. But this high-tech government funding announcement in Montreal quickly became about Saudi Arabia. We continue to engage with uh, the government of, uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs had a long conversation with their foreign minister yesterday, and uh, diplomatic uh, talks continue. Christian Freeland's long conversation did not bring a quick end to this feud, at least not from the Saudi perspective. Canada knows what it needs to do. Canada started this, and it's up to Canada to find a way out of it. That's easier said than done. It's, it's quite a quagmire. We're now dealing with a kingdom that is accustomed to getting its way. Accustomed with getting its way, not accustomed with being lectured about human rights on Twitter by a Canadian cabinet minister, which means the solution may lie in pushing things up the ladder. And I think that uh, dialogue needs to happen between leaders of government uh, on a direct basis. Uh, I don't think this has been handled well to this stage. Or in climbing down. It appears as if the Saudis are calling for an apology or some sort of public um, take back, if you will. Uh, very difficult to do in these circumstances when this government in particular has staked its claim on human rights and in particular women's rights. Is offering an apology to Saudi Arabia something you would be consider? You would consider? Canadians have always expected our government to speak strongly, firmly, clearly and politely uh, about uh, the need to respect human rights at home and around the world. We will continue to do that. We will continue to stand up. So if the PM isn't going to apologize, and that seems pretty obvious there, David, what steps is Canada willing to take to try and de-escalate things? Well, you know, Rosie, Christia Freeland's been pretty busy since all of this started, and she's taken two political tacks here. One, she's calling countries in the Middle East and in Europe, seeking their interventions and their advice uh, in ways to resolve this. Notably, she's spoken to Sweden and Germany, who have had similar disputes with Saudi Arabia in the past. And secondly, she's dealing directly with Saudi Arabia, and I'm told that could include another phone call with the foreign minister if things don't calm down. Okay, at the official level, Canada is trying to figure out what exactly Saudi Arabia's retaliations mean for, for Canada. Any, any word on that part of it? Yeah, they're trying to quantify some things, the impact on hospitals and universities and on farmers. And, and they're also trying to get clarity on reports that Saudi Arabia has ordered a sell-off of its Canadian assets. This was something that was reported in the Financial Times. And Canada, I'm told, is trying to see if this is, in fact, the case and, and what it would mean if, if it is true. But in the short term, Rosie, no apology is coming. And this issue is staling with Christopher Freeland right now. It is not going up to the prime minister's office. Okay, David Cochran, thanks for that.
Okay, so that's the game of diplomacy. But what about all the real people caught in the middle of this? Hajj is the annual Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. It's quickly approaching, and many Canadian Muslims are now afraid to go. Kaden Nicholson looks at that. This travel agency is now something of a crisis centre. Jamil Ahmed working two phones at once with nervous Muslims who paid thousands to take the trip of a lifetime and are now backing out. 60% call is all the issue, what will happen, what will happen. Every Muslim is expected to undertake the Hajj, a religious pilgrimage to sacred sites at least once. Yesterday, Ahmed cancelled 15 trips because of escalating tensions between Canada and Saudi Arabia. Saudi's national air carrier has cancelled all flights to Canada starting next week, which could strand hundreds of travellers there well beyond the end of the Hajj. Overstaying an approved visit to Saudi Arabia could lend you a fine or time behind bars. Ottawa is still trying to figure out how many Canadians will be affected and what it can do to help. I hope no one gets stuck, but if they do, um, I encourage them to reach out to our emer emergency watch centre or call our embassy. Some people are still willing to risk it. Fakhrizel Halim and his wife left for Riyadh today. Now we have no idea what, uh, how we, uh, we are going to get back to Canada. Still, Halim isn't worried he'll be stuck. He is, after all, a man of faith. We ordinary people who are going for Hajj in 2019 have nothing to do with all this politics. Malik Mushtaq is less confident. He estimates his business could lose millions in religious travel package sales if the two countries don't soon bury the hatchet. As a Canadian, is our government and Saudi government, please solve that, this problem. A solution which seems unlikely anytime soon. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And travelers aren't the only ones who could pay a price for this dispute. Last night, we talked about the Saudi students who may soon have to leave this country, and among them, medical students who contribute a lot to our healthcare system. The University of Toronto has trained over a thousand Saudi doctors in the last 40 years. There are 216 Saudi medical residents and fellows working in hospitals around the city. 225 are providing similar service in Montreal through McGill's medical program. In total, Canada has some 800 Saudi doctors in training. Pulling them out would likely put more strain on an already overtaxed system. And while Canadians ponder this whole messy tango, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is also abuzz with insults and attempts to shame Canada online and on the air. Here's a sense of what they're saying. Arabat Moscow and Damiha Al Saudi of Yoji Mawasafatha. Saudi broadcasters quick with anti-Canada reports. In Canada, women are highly persecuted, a guest just said. Well, that's interesting. Let's have a look. According to a 2017 report by the Cato Institute, Canada scored a 10 out of 10 in terms of women's security and women's freedom of movement. Saudi Arabia, for the record, scored a 5 for women's security and a 0 for women's freedom of movement. Another claim about Canada's persecution of prisoners of conscience, using Holocaust denier Ernst Zundel as an example, as well as the controversial Jordan Peterson, who is not in prison. A virtual Saudi electronic army has unleashed a series of anti-Canada tweets, too, and launched a hashtag. Hashtag Saudis are deeply concerned about followed by a wave of tweets pointing out Canada's human rights hypocrisy, Quebec sovereignty, Canada's treatment of Indigenous people. If you're a good global citizen... Human rights activist Iyad al-Baghdadi says the kingdom's so fury speech, about Canada is reminiscent of how the Crown Prince has handled Qatar and crisis. Yemen. We have been watching Mohammed bin Salman uh, for, for several years now, and he's not good at walkbacks. Whenever he's cornered, he doubles down. He said he's heard from worried Canadians in Saudi Arabia. They're nervous because they watched what happened with Qatar, and they know that uh, this young prince, Mohammed bin Salman, does not seem to have... Uh, he doesn't seem to have any kind of impulse control. There's always this escalation. And the question is, what is the next... What, what comes next? Is he going to ask Canadians to leave the country? Leave the country? That's the tone of this Saudi political cartoon. A Canadian telling a Saudi to release the activists... And the response to the shock Canadian, get out. 
Okay, so that's the, well, let's call it creative response to all of this in the Saudi media. What's happening in Western media? Outside Canada, it's been very quiet with one notable exception. For the first time in its history, the Washington Post has published an editorial in Arabic today, and it is a fearlessly outspoken defense of Canada in this dispute. It reads, in part, what Ms. Freeland and Canada correctly understand is that human rights and basic liberty are universal values, not the property of kings and dictators to arbitrarily grant and remove on a whim. It is great to see Canada holding aloft the human rights banner. But Canada should not have to do this alone. As diplomatic relations between the two countries worsen, a possible reprieve for a Saudi man seeking asylum in Canada. He was scheduled to be deported this morning, but the United Nations asked Ottawa to keep him here until his case is investigated further. We've changed his name and his wife's because they're worried about the safety of their relatives in Saudi Arabia. Jayla Bernstein has their story. A symbol of the future that Noura wants for her family hangs on her living room wall. The safe country uh, for me and for my kids. Noura and her husband Omar hope to start their new lives here in Montreal. I leave everything in my country to stay live together. But they're not together. Omar is now in hospital, but he was being held in this detention centre. His wife and children's asylum applications are being processed, but Omar was declared ineligible. He originally came to Canada alone, fearing for his safety, after he was accused of criticizing Saudi Arabia's actions in Yemen. He then withdrew his claim to travel back to Saudi Arabia to help his wife, who'd been arrested and detained. In Canada, you need to wait a year to reapply for asylum. Omar's lawyers have been searching for a way to help him stay. The situation is quite clear in Saudi Arabia right now, especially for Shias. We don't understand why Canada didn't intervene before. Omar was supposed to be on a flight to Saudi Arabia this morning, but the United Nations Human Rights Committee stepped in, asking Canada to delay the deportation while they examine the case. It is obviously Canada's sovereign right and duty to, uh, uh, to make its own decisions as an independent country, and we will do that, uh, but we will weigh very carefully what the UN has asked. At an event in Montreal, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about the case, specifically about deporting someone to a country his government has been critical of. We always expect, uh, and Canadians expect, that our uh, immigration system, which is based on rules, on values, on principles that are very clearly laid out, uh, be followed in its integrity. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Noura remains hopeful. My kids every day told me what time my father come back, what time. Omar is expected to have a detention review hearing tomorrow morning. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. We're watching several other developing stories tonight, including the death of a foreign national after an altercation with Canadian border officers. Very little is being said publicly about what happened aboard a plane about to take off from Calgary Airport yesterday. Two officers were trying to deport a man when, according to the CBSA, he went into medical distress. Calgary police won't say what happened, only that the altercation was physical. Various investigations are underway. I want you all to know that I intend to run in the upcoming by-election here in Burnaby South. Jagmeet Singh making the official announcement he's running for parliament. He hasn't had a seat since he became the leader of the NDP 10 months ago. The riding was previously held by NDP MP Kennedy Stewart, who resigned in June. Singh says if he wins the by-election, he'll move to the Vancouver suburb. So here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Victoria plans to take down a statue of the country's first prime minister. Briar Stewart takes us to the debate on the street. And the votes are still being recounted in Ohio tonight. Keith Bogue breaks down why one election has such big midterm implications. And a wild up-close encounter is our moment of the day. It was so exciting for the guests. Who could imagine coming from the UK, getting up in your bathrobe and seeing whales that close to the dock?
The margin of victory is too thin to see in Ohio. Republicans are fighting to hang on to what was once a safe seat. Tonight, as you can see, Troy Balderson leads by less than a percentage point over his Democratic rival. And thousands of provisional ballots cast by voters who don't appear on the rolls but are eligible have yet to be counted. As Keith Bogue explains, this is many wondering whether Ohio is a sign of what's coming in the November midterms. I'd like to thank President Trump. The Republican candidate Troy Balderson took it as given last night that he will end up the winner in Ohio's 12th district. And he credited Donald Trump for making it so. Trump flew into Ohio Saturday to help push Balderson over the top. We must elect Troy Balderson. But the fact is Balderson may not even be the winner. There are still ballots to count and the race is tight. And as far as giving due credit, Democrats might have been even more driven by Trump to vote against Balderson than Republicans were to vote for him. In any event, Democrat Danny O'Connor saw no reason to concede. We're not stopping now. Tomorrow we rest and then we keep fighting through to November. Indeed, no matter the final score, O'Connor and Balderson will face each other again on the ballot in November. And this once rock-solid Republican district now looks like a toss-up for the midterms. Democrats are tickled at how much money and effort Republicans are putting into campaigns in what should be safe districts. A race that we had no business winning required $5 million of Republican money, a visit from the president, and we're competitive in a place where the, the congressman in 2016 won by over 30 points. Democrats are going to the polls in special elections and off-year elections in unusually high numbers, as though it were a presidential year. So their chances of winning back a congressional house in November look good. Plus, there's this. Today, we announced criminal charges. The FBI charged Republican Congressman Chris Collins from New York with securities crimes today. He tipped his son to confidential corporate information at the expense of regular investors, and then he lied about it to law enforcement to cover it up. That not only hangs a cloud over Chris Collins' re-election bid in November, it risks making Trump Republicans look like creatures from the very swamp the president promised to drain. Keep folks, CBC News, Washington. Now, another thing to watch in November's crucial midterm elections, more women candidates than ever will be fighting for seats in Congress and for governorships. After last night's primaries, Democrats and Republicans have nominated, get this, 185 women in U.S. House races this year, breaking 2016's record of 167. The overwhelming majority of those women, so more than three quarters, are Democrats. There are also 11 female nominees for governor this year, and that tops the previous high of 10. Still ahead on The National, saying goodbye to Massey Hall for now, before the iconic music hall closed for major renovations. I had a chance to tour it with some legendary musicians. We'll revisit those memories. And reading between the notes, meet the Canadian who says he has conducted mathematical analyses of some of the Beatles' greatest hits just to figure out which songs were written by John and which ones were written by Paul. John. Uh, made a lot of use out of uh, the tonic chord, which is the major chord, and the relative minor chord, which is the sixth chord. On the National Tonight, the U.S. will impose new sanctions against Russia over a nerve agent attack. Back in March, ex-Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter were hospitalized for weeks after being poisoned. The British government has welcomed the sanctions. And the Stanford student whose sexual assault trial drew international attention has lost his appeal. Brock Turner was convicted of raping a woman outside a frat party, but it was his sentence that garnered outrage just six months. Turner appealed the conviction, arguing the trial wasn't fair. State police is fully prepared to act on any insightful violence, any acts of violence, or any violations of law. A preemptive state of emergency has been declared in Virginia ahead of the one-year anniversary of the Charlottesville White Nationalist Rally. 
Heather Heyer was killed and dozens more were injured when a car plowed into a crowd of counter-protesters. The rally followed a debate over whether to tear down a statue of Confederate officer Robert E. Lee. So that U.S. debate over Confederate statues has a certain echo in Canada. Sir John A. Macdonald is commemorated on everything from bridges to the $10 bill, but he was also a key player in the creation of the residential school system. And so now the city of Victoria is planning to have one less reminder of him. Briar Stewart went there today. Most Canadians know Sir John A. Macdonald as the country's first prime minister, but he was also an MP for Victoria, and his statue has been standing here for more than 35 years, but likely not much longer. In order to really commit to reconciliation, uh, we need to remove the statue of Johnny McDonald from the front steps of City Hall. The driving force of Confederation is going into storage because of a history that's not celebrated. The fact that his government created the Indian Act and established the residential school system where thousands were abused and generations of trauma followed. The decision to move the statue was made by a group called the City Family. It's made up of local officials and members from nearby First Nations, and their whole focus is on reconciliation. And one of the issues that came up was that some of the members were very uncomfortable walking past this statue and into City Hall. Inside this building is an Indigenous exhibit dedicated to reconciliation, and one of the artists behind it says it was time for the statue to go. What is really important to me about the statue being removed is that it's the local indigenous nations, the Lekwungen nations known today as the Squamalt and Songhees, who have asked and pushed for this to be removed. The plan is to take down the statue on Saturday and put up a plaque saying that the city is trying to figure out how to put his legacy into context. The decision has to be voted on by city council first. And while it's expected to pass, not everyone agrees. I don't like that it's happened so suddenly. I think it is an issue that deserves uh, public discussion. And there is plenty of debate. History is with us and I think they should uh, consider that in addition to being politically sensitive. Often you hear this that's an erasure of history but um, you know definitely a, a more modern approach to it and looking at it I, I think so. I think it's a good thing. Because he believes McDonald should be remembered for all of his contributions to Canada instead of just being unquestionably revered. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Victoria. Canadian history is full of polarizing figures, many of them recognized despite the repression of Indigenous people, and that has meant a major rethink. <laughs> Until January, this statue of Edward Cornwallis had stood in a Halifax park for nearly nine decades. But the city founder also put a bounty on the scalps of Mi'kmaq people. The council voted the bronze figure be taken down. This statue of BC's first chief justice was recently removed from the Law Society's foyer. Matthew Begbie was nicknamed the hanging judge for sentencing six Indigenous chiefs to death in the pre-Confederation days. Thank you so much for changing that name. That's a big thing, because that's part of reconciliation. Last year, the Prime Minister stripped the name off the building that houses his office. Hector Louis Langevin was a member of Sir John A's cabinet and an architect of the residential school system. And speaking of schools, Toronto's Ryerson University has been under real pressure to change its name. Egerton Ryerson may have been a pioneer of public education, but he also helped shape policy for residential schools. And the federal government is preparing to take another step towards reconciliation by exonerating Chief Poundmaker. In 1885, the legendary Cree leader was convicted of treason for his role in the Northwest Rebellion. But to his people, Poundmaker was a man of peace who rejected violence and saved lives. And for members of the Saskatchewan First Nation that bears his name, it's high time Canadian history reflect that. The CBC's Olivia Stefanovic has more. Just arrived uh, half hour ago. Drilling into history is a delicate task. But after more than 130 years, people in Poundmaker Cree Nation are ready for redemption. One, go. 
to unveil the truth about their founder. This painting by renowned Cree artist Kent Monkman was donated to the First Nation in preparation of Chief Poundmaker's exoneration. So what's he doing exactly in this picture? I think he's like he's telling them about that pipe that we stood up, we, we made an oath with this pipe. It just confirms uh, the stories that we've been told and how we live our lives here. It depicts Poundmaker, whose Cree name was Pitawana Piawin, as he is remembered by his people, a peacemaker who prevented bloodshed but was convicted of treason. He didn't have to go through that. He didn't need to go through that, and yet that happened, and we're ready to, I guess, to forgive that and just kind of move on from there. And Celeste Tatusis is a descendant of Palmaker, five generations back. We want to change that perception of our, our people. For over a century, Chief Poundmaker has been described as a traitor in history books. But people here know that's not true. And now, the rest of Canada will. This whole area marks yeah. the battlefield. Poundmaker stopped his warriors from chasing Canadian forces down during a battle on these grounds in 1885. It's believed he prevented the deaths of 330 men. Former Chief Blaine Favel has done the math. He estimates that translates to about 100,000 descendants who are still alive today. So that's why, we, why he was hugely important. The peaceful settling of the plains is not disconnected to the life of Chief Poundmaker. But Poundmaker would not be seen in this light until after his death. He was tried and convicted for treason, accused of provoking the fight, he was jailed and died a few months after his release. This is a huge open wound, a festering wound for Canadian uh, Indigenous relations. For the next 35 years, Favel says the community wasn't allowed to have a chief. The government took away their guns and horses, leaving them with little to make a livelihood. Favel is negotiating the terms of the exoneration. Um, I think I'll have a hard time keeping a uh, you know, a dry eye, a dry eye that day, because it's so significant for the country. Yeah. Favel wants an apology from the prime minister, followed by a financial settlement. Canada is built um, day by day, relationship by relationship, so it feels like we're coming into the Canadian fabric. Ottawa is moving forward with the community's request. A date hasn't been set, but when it does, history will have to be rewritten. So will this sign have to change? Sign's got to go. Sign's got to go. This sign will go, that sign will go, all the signs around here will go. Canadian history books will have to change. Well, I just love this land. It's, there's, it's just beautiful. Mavis Billisberger gets emotional each time she drives in. Poundmaker was her great, great, great grandfather. He chose these valleys to make a home for his people. It's time to, to make things right because that's all they were after was the land. And, uh, well, we survived. And it was because of Chief Palmaker, because he, uh, uh, in this community anyway, that um, um, he, thought, he thought of the future. He thought of uh, um, future generations living on this land. Now those generations will grow up knowing and reading their people's truth about how their leader put his community first. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Palmaker Cree Nation. Still ahead on The National, this is my favorite part, surprise visitors at a Vancouver Island Lodge in our moment of the day. I love it that wildlife is in the news instead of something that's not as fun. This clip has made international news. You can see why, oh my gosh, it's racked up millions of views. We'll bring you the story behind the moment in our moment of the day. And The National today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon, goes deeper on the top stories and highlights some stories you may have missed. Today, a scathing new report from Amnesty International links hundreds of migrant deaths at sea directly to new anti-immigration policies from European countries. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National.
Love that song. And a fawn. See you soon from the staff at Toronto's Massey Hall, one of the country's legendary venues. Closed its doors in July for two years of renovations. In the last month, production equipment has been removed and stored. The original seats from 1894 have been assessed and inventoried. But let's revisit that iconic concert stage before the construction started. Good evening. Tonight, we invite you into the home of the Toronto Symphony. This was the place, man. This is like, when you've played Massey Hall, you've arrived. The room makes me smile because it's mixed up with so many great memories, both as a fan and as a performer. When you get on that stage, you know that, you know, you're playing with the big cats. Like, this is where history was made in your industry. Some amazing shows have happened here. <laughs> Imagine if Hart Massey could hear those voices today speak with such reverence about the gift he gave the city of Toronto almost 125 years ago. A memorial to his son who died at the age of 36. A concert hall that was also meant as a town hall. A secular space to celebrate not just music, but speeches and sport. This is the hallway into centuries, and what we've done is pulled up old programs, newspaper clippings, mm -hmm. photographs. It's a hall of fame of musical stars, from the most Canadian of performers to the man who was once the world's most famous singer. Tickets for Enrico Caruso's final concert here in 1920 cost the equivalent of a month's salary for a laborer. And there were many people who either couldn't afford the $8 to come and see him play or couldn't get a ticket even if they could. And such was the crowd outside of Massey that he came out onto the fire escapes and sang an aria at the end of the concert for the crowd that was assembled below. To walk around is to feel the history of this place, but you can see it too. No one questions the need for a renovation here, but some are worried about what that might do to the essence of the hall. You always want a sound for the audience to be great. And I hope they don't ruin that. Gordon Lightfoot knows what's at stake. He's played here more than any headliner, more than 160 times. Now, almost 80, he's about to perform what's become an annual series of concerts in a place that feels like home. One of the things that I found interesting is you walk in your front door and here we go, two images of Massey Hall inside and out. You can hardly really tell what this is, but it's the interior. You gotta get right in there. Mm -hmm. Of course, we loved going there because it was like a, we'd made it through another year of living, of, of playing and performing. When you need me. Do you remember the first time you were on stage, that Kiwanis Music Festival? Oh, yes, I, absolutely. I was 13, and I, was, I knew I was going to be singing uh, uh, that evening, and I, I was kind of nervous. And I walked all over the place. I walked up upstairs and downstairs, and it sure felt different. It felt, felt big, too. It felt like, like something really important, uh, which it was. So I just wondered, somebody who's watching now, who will be watching this, in Calgary, let's say, or yeah, St. Yeah. John's, Newfoundland, and they're going, Massey Hall, like who, what's so special about Massey Hall? What would you say to them? There's something charming about, uh, about the old place. I mean, it's, it's got a great sound. I mean, it's got, it has a wonderful ambient sound. <laughs> You can hear that wonderful ambient sound for yourself in a series of recordings. The greatest jazz concert ever. Oh man, look at my life. Neil Young, live at Massey Hall, 1971. Come on! And Rush, all the world's a stage. It was the first time we'd recorded live, mm -hmm. so the first time the uh, recording truck was going during a performance, so it makes you hyper aware of every note you play. Now you guys are an arena rock group. I mean, you know, in terms of like the sound is so big, what do you have to do? Bring the volume from 11 down to eight when you're here? 
Uh, no, we didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> it's truth. The truth is that it is a tough building for a really loud band like us, and uh, the sound pressure level is quite intense. Uh, so we sound very loud in here. What did it mean to you to play here? Oh, it was ginormous for me, uh, personally. I'm my bandmates, too. Uh, Massey Hall, for an uh, Ontarian, uh, Canadian, was a legendary building. And I saw so many heroes here that the idea of playing here was sort of incomprehensible. So the first time you do load in and you actually play, it's, it's tremendously thrilling. This has always been Canada's special music hall, just like uh, Carnegie is to New Yorkers. And, and uh, you know, the Royal Albert Hall is to Londoners. I love the connection between Rush and Bare Naked Ladies. Ed Robertson tells the story, in right. fact, he told us the story of getting a bottle of champagne from you when they had, I think it was a four-night stand here. Right. With that four-night stand, Bare Naked Ladies broke Rush's record for consecutive concert nights. This champagne came with a card, and it was a congratulatory card. It said, you're only supposed to do three nights, boys. And I carried that bottle of champagne around for about <laughs> two hours between soundcheck and the show and explained to everybody, it's from Rush. Rush <laughs> sent us champagne. It was sort of a record at the time for a rock band. And we were just proud of them. And in case you think the old hall's appeal is lost on a new generation of musicians, listen to the good lovelies who played here for the first time just a few weeks ago. They don't always get a chance, because of where my microphone is, I don't always get a chance to fully look at Caroline and Sue on stage, but tonight it was like, I didn't want to oh, stop watching perfect. you. Because yeah. I was like, you're on the Nancy Hall stage. Yeah. Well, I am too! <laughs> <laughs> oh We've definitely played bigger places than this, but it's so legendary that it's like, it feels so much bigger than it is. And there are a lot of people out there, but yeah, it's, it's, it's that there, it, it sort of goes up rather than out. So you, yeah. everybody's yeah. right there. There are a mm -hmm. lot of them, but they're all, it makes it, it's actually quite an intimate it's room beautiful. from the stage. And that was a really nice, really nice thing. Mm. Yeah. So Massey Hall's magic lives on, but it's showing those 124 years. And so funded largely by the federal and provincial government, the reno will be extensive. So you have this awesome Lego model. It's pretty incredible. It is incredible. It will take more than two years. There will be new washrooms, two new performance spaces. The seats will be changed, and about 100 original stained glass windows covered up long ago to keep out street noise will be restored. All while trying to preserve what has made this national historic site so beloved by so many performers. So will there be a change? Probably, um, but what we're hoping is that it's a change for the better and that the, the acoustics in the hall fine tune what's already an incredible instrument, which is, which is the original auditorium. The new look with that old sound will be revealed in the fall of 2020. While we're on the subject of classic sounds, let's turn to a Beatles song that has posed a bit of a mystery. Did Paul write it or did John? There are places I remember. It's a famous song, and people have strong feelings one way or the other, whether they're musicians or non musicians, about the song. Some are dead and some are living. In my life, I love them all. Jason Brown is a professor of mathematics with a special interest in music and a lifelong love of the Beatles. He and a colleague set out to use stylology, a statistical analysis of musical traits, to try to prove who likely composed In My Life. Most Beatles songs are simply credited to Lennon and McCartney. They wrote over 200 songs. They both could have written, you know, anything at the time. Of course, a lot of fans had their own ideas about what makes a Paul song or a John song. So you think of yesterday when you think of Paul, and what did Paul do in Yesterday? Or for John, you might think of Nowhere Man, or Norwegian Wood. But they don't represent necessarily the general song that they write. 
Brown analyzed songs where the authorship was well known, collecting data on melody, chord sequences, and other musical characteristics. So after weighing all the evidence? It was likely John who had written the song in my life, rather than Paul. A potential disappointment for McCartney fans, but there's a silver lining. I think one of the amazing things is the Beatles have been over since 1970, and yet people talk about them, and yet they're at the forefront of discussion, they're at the forefront of uh, musicality, and what a great thing. Okay, so these tourists were at Great Bear Lodge in BC to see, well, you know, bears, but they got something a little bigger. Two humpback whales dropped by for breakfast, and it was caught on video. As of today, that video has been viewed 2.1 million times on Instagram and like a million now after we give it to you. We spoke with the lodge owner about her early morning guests, and that is our moment of the day. Who could imagine getting up in your bathrobe and seeing whales that close to the dock? I was waking up in my cabin at Great Bear Lodge and I saw a whale blow in the distance. And then Marlo spotted them on another dock. She's one of our guides. And so she came, got everyone over that dock just in time to see a whale creating a net of bubbles around some fish. And then both whales came up to eat them. So I posted the uh, video on Instagram. I thought it'd be really fun for some of our you know, friends to see it. And then next thing you know, we're starting to get a lot more likes. So it was really exciting for us as staff because we usually see more bears and whales. I love it that wildlife is in the news instead of something that's not as fun. We love it too. I mean, two things come to mind when I look at that video. One is, what a beautiful country we have. We saw it in Olivia Stefanovic's piece as well, just, just gorgeous. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, whether it's the Bay of Fundy or the West Coast, the magic of whales. Well, and, you know, those 2.1 million views, half of them have been us today looking at this <laughs> again and again. Um, I am astonished at the way they eat. I've never seen that before. And apparently these humpback whales eat for 22 hours a day during the summer, a little bit like me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> And you may want to know how we decide on these videos. Well, we get a list of different things from our great uh, associate producers and producers. And Adrian and I saw this one and we said, whales! <laughs> yes. Like, what else can we talk about? That's the national for August 8th. We had a whale of a time. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>